Hello, and welcome to the Fast Track to Understanding Ham Radio Antennas. I'm Michael Burnett, AF7KB, and I'm the author and narrator of the Fast Track series of Ham License Learning Systems. I'm also the author of the soon-to-be-published book, which has the same title as this program. What a remarkable coincidence. Time is short today. Here's a quick look at what we'll cover. We'll talk about how the signal from your radio gets turned into a propagating electromagnetic wave. We'll hit some basic electrical characteristics that come into play in antenna science. We'll touch on impedance matching, why it's important and how it's done, and we'll hit dipole antennas, monopole antennas, such as quarter-wave vertical antennas, and how directional antennas work. Now, my goal here today is to give you a good basic framework for thinking about antennas, not to turn you into an instant antenna engineer. This won't be the Every Antenna Ever Created presentation, either. That's a book, and it has already been written. The League will happily send you a fresh new copy for 50 bucks. It's a dandy book, too. This also won't be the stupendously difficult math presentation, either. Many technical books on antenna theory don't seem to be able to make it more than a couple of paragraphs without lapsing into something like this, which is some lovely calculus, but really not necessary for getting a signal from your shack to somewhere useful. An antenna is a transducer. It converts electrical energy into electromagnetic energy. It is also, or at least you hope it is, an impedance matching device that matches the output impedance of your transmitter, probably 50 ohms, to the input impedance of the universe, known as free space, which is about 377 ohms. Now, Maxwell's equations shown here for entertainment purposes only, believe me, tell us that it should be possible to create an electromagnetic wave that will propagate through space. They don't give us any information on how to create that wave. So from the time Maxwell published these equations, it took 16 years before Heinrich Hertz figured out a way to send and receive those waves. Now, here's one of his experiments. This is the receiver. It consists of a coil hooked up to a spark gap. The stuff on this table is the transmitter. It's a spark gap transmitter fed with a resonant circuit. Now, here is his antenna. He was working on frequencies right around 50 megahertz, our 6-meter band. And that antenna looks to be a slightly short half-wavelength dipole with what we'd call capacitance hats on the ends. In other words, Hertz had already figured out how to make an effective resonant antenna. And the basic principles have not changed one bit since Hertz's time. Here's what was going on in Heinrich's antenna and in your antenna. We energize the antenna with negative voltage on one terminal and positive on the other. The negative voltage pushes electrons away, and the positive voltage pulls electrons toward it. We have current flow. Well, this current flow can't go on forever. That is, after all, an open circuit. Ideally, just as the charge reaches that dead end, one or the other, the charges reverse. The current flow reverses. As the current flow flows back and forth through the antenna, it jostles electrons in their orbits, which causes them to radiate an electromagnetic wave. Now, Mark Twain once wrote, Thunder is good, thunder is impressive, but it is lightning that does the work. When we think about antennas, we might say something similar. Voltage is good. Voltage is impressive, but it is current that does the work. See, it's the current that upsets those electrons, 
and causes them to emit those electromagnetic waves, and that's why we want to maximize current flow in our antennas. At that instant where the current flow is zero, in the middle of the flip of positive and negative, right there is where the magic of radio really happens. See, up until that instant, we're just ampere, making a compass needle move next to an energized wire, and that effect is interesting, but it doesn't cover a lot of distance. But then, right at that zero crossing, the electric and magnetic fields around the antenna detach from the antenna and take off through space. Just like that, we have a self-propagating electromagnetic wave propagating its way off to infinity. Now, I mentioned that an antenna is an impedance-matching device, matching the output impedance of your transmitter to the input impedance of free space. Now, that term, free space, is one you'll run into a lot in the world of antennas. What does it mean? Technically, Free space is a space with no electromagnetic or gravitational fields. In other words, something like the isotropic antenna, it's something that doesn't exist, but is useful for doing the engineering math. Now, practically speaking, we can say free space is a space around an antenna with nothing electrically significant in the near field of the antenna. That raises the question, what's this near field? Well, put simply, the near field is the area around the antenna where a lot is going on with the non-propagating fields around the antenna. If a conductor shows up in that near field, it's going to have significant effects on the antenna's impedance, and therefore on its effectiveness as an impedance-matching device. Now, in the case of directional antennas, that's taken into account in the design. In the case of dipoles, our long wires we love so much, best practice is to keep that near field clear of conductors. That includes the surface of the Earth. That's why one of the least common sentences in ham radio is, My antenna is too high. Nobody ever says that. Generally speaking, the more you can keep your antenna's near field clear of extra conductors, the closer that antenna is going to perform to those wonderful specifications from the manufacturer or designer. Now, if your antenna is not performing the way you think it should, the first place to look is in the near field. You know, for a simple piece of wire or rod, an antenna sure has a lot going on, electrically speaking. There are four key parameters that affect antenna performance. First, there are two distinct types of resistance, neither of which you can measure with your rusty trusty ohm meter. There's radiation resistance, and there's ohmic resistance. Radiation resistance is the resistance that reflects the work done in radiating the signal. We want radiation resistance to be very high relative to ohmic resistance. Now, ohmic resistance represents the amount of applied signal that just gets turned into heat. The ratio of radiation resistance to ohmic resistance determines the antenna's efficiency. Then there's the antenna's capacitance and inductance. More accurately, I should say it's capacitive and inductive reactances. Okay, we need to take a brief detour here, the relevance of which will be made clear later. Capacitive and inductive reactants throw voltage and current out of phase with each other. When a current starts to pass through a coil, the coil resists the flow of that current. Voltage increases because the coil acts like a resistor at that point, but current does not pass. We end up with a graph that looks something like this. Now, in this case, we say the voltage 
is leading the current. We could also say, and this is a very relevant way of saying this relative to antennas, the current is delayed relative to the voltage. Now, through a capacitor, things are just the opposite. As the cycle begins, current flows easily through the capacitor, or at least it behaves as if it does, so there's virtually zero voltage across the capacitor. It's acting almost like a straight wire at that point. As the capacitor fills up with charge, though, the current decreases and the voltage increases. So in this case, then, current is leading voltage. Now, for a very long time, electronic students have memorized these phase relationships with the immortal phrase, E. Lie the Ice Man. See, across an inductance, L, voltage, E, leads current, I. Across a capacitance, C, current, I, leads voltage, E. E. Lie the Ice Man. And here is an actual photo of Eli himself with his ice wagon. If you look closely, you can see that Eli's ice company was owned by Roy G. Biv, another famous fellow in the world of electronics. So, in an antenna, we find radiation resistance, ohmic resistance, capacitive reactance, and inductive reactance, and all that combines to create the impedance of the antenna. Now, impedance does not necessarily contain any reactance. It can be purely resistive, in which case we call it a simple impedance. If reactance gets into the picture, we call it a complex impedance. Our goal for our antennas is to have them be, or at least seem to be, purely resistive impedances, simple impedances. Hang on a second here. How did capacitance and inductance get into this picture anyway? All right, here's a dipole. Two relatively straight pieces of wire. Well, here we have a conductor and another conductor separated by an insulator. It's a big old capacitor. And capacitors make current lead voltage, and they tend to block low frequencies while passing high frequencies. Since there's an alternating current flowing through that wire, there's a magnetic field expanding and contracting around that wire, creating inductance. And even though it isn't a coil, that wire is still an inductor. And inductors, of course, are the opposite of capacitors in that they tend to pass low frequencies and block high frequencies. And, of course, Eli the Iceman, right? They make voltage lead current. So the equivalent circuit of what looks like a couple of innocent pieces of wire is something like this. We have a couple of resistances, some capacitance and some inductance, all in series with a source of AC, and that all adds up to a series resonant circuit. If the applied signal is lower than the circuit's resonant frequency, the capacitance tries to block the signal. If the applied signal is higher than the current's resonant frequency, the inductance tries to block the signal. Now, right at the resonant frequency, the Goldilocks just right resonant frequency, the capacitance and inductance basically balance out and disappear, and the antenna presents its lowest possible impedance. And that's when maximum current flow happens. Remember, it's current that creates the signal. The exact same equivalent circuit could represent a monopole antenna like a quarter-wave vertical where one side of the dipole is replaced by a counterpoise or ground radials. You still get maximum current in the system when the system is operated at its resonant frequency. This is why the license exams at every level focus so much on how to create resonant antennas. We should mention, though, that there are non-resonant antenna designs that work perfectly well. I have one in my backyard. 
they do require some sort of impedance matching device and sometimes more than one to make them work correctly. We'll focus on resonant antennas here today, though. When we talk about impedance, we're really talking about the ratio of voltage to current. Now, that's not a metaphorical ratio. Impedance is quite literally equal to E over I, just like resistance. When you hear something has high impedance, that means it has relatively high voltage and low current. Low impedance is the opposite. So knowing that, let's take a look at current and voltage in a dipole. In this picture, the current's shown in blue and the voltage in red. You can see that in the center, and in the case of this antenna, that's also the feed point, the impedance is relatively low. Lots of current, not much voltage. As we travel out to the ends, those values gradually reverse until we have maximum voltage and minimum current at the ends. The way we at least hope it works out, the impedance there in the center is about 50 ohms. But if we move that feed point, the feed point impedance will be higher. And that's how we ended up with the off-center fed dipole, the OCFD, also known as the Wyndham antenna design. The OCFD has a feed point impedance of around 300 ohms, so it needs to be fed with 300 ohm feed line, or, you know, there has to be some kind of matching somewhere along the way. From the time we study for our very first license, we learn we are to match the impedance of the antenna system to the impedance of the transmitter. Now, why is that? Well, there are two reasons. First, to transfer maximum power from a source to a load, the impedances of those loads must match. There's a thought experiment, much beloved of electronic engineering students, that demonstrates this. Imagine a circuit like this one. It's a circuit that contains a battery and a couple of resistors. R1 on the left there represents the internal resistance of that battery. The battery and the resistance constitute the source. Now, why are they the source? They are the source simply because we say so. That's it. R2 is the load. Why? Again, because we say so. We connect an imaginary voltmeter across R2, and we set up an imaginary ammeter to measure the current through the circuit. Then we start substituting various values of resistors in R2 and doing lots and lots of Ohm's Law and Joule's Law calculations to determine the amount of power being dissipated by R2. And by the way, if you're teaching ham classes and you're just a little sadistic, <laughs> this is a very satisfying exercise to drill your students on Ohm's and Joule's law and teach impedance matching all at the same time. We're not going to go through all the calculations here today. You'll have to trust me when I tell you that with this setup, the maximum power transfer will occur when R2 equals 1,000 ohms. And here's a graph of the results at various resistances for R2. You can see there's a pretty dramatic peak when we hit a matching value for R2. So power transfer is one reason we want to match impedances. The other reason, of course, is to lower our SWR our standing wave ratio. Lowering SWR is really not so much about effective power transfer as it is about avoiding having your transmitter automatically lower its power to avoid melting its final transistors. So what is the source of SWR? Where does it come from? Now, here are the culprits. Neither capacitive reactants nor inductive reactants radiate power. They store power, but they don't radiate it. When that power does not get radiated, well, it has to go somewhere, and the only somewhere available is the output terminal of your transmitter. Now, this, of course, is what we all call an antenna tuner. <laughs> Worst name for anything in ham radio. This device wonderful though it may be, does not 
tune antennas. No amount of knob twisting on this thing will turn a ten-foot piece of wire into a resonant 80-meter antenna. Sorry. What this box does do, and does very well, is deceive your transmitter into thinking that it's feeding a 50-ohm load. That way, your transmitter's protection circuits don't kick in, and you pump your full wattage into the antenna, minus, of course, the losses inside this box. Functionally, this box is like a transformer. Let's imagine we have a transmitter with 50-ohm output impedance going into a 300-ohm antenna. We could match up those impedances with a transformer with six turns on the output side for every one turn on the input side, because we have a six-to-one impedance mismatch. And we don't often use transformers for this purpose, because they're expensive and lossy and not very adjustable, and antenna tuners are far more versatile. Well, that gets us to the topic of directional antennas, also known as beam antennas. Probably the most popular is the Yagi antenna. Most directional antennas work on the same principles as the Yagi, so we're going to look at the Yagi, but just know that uh, these, this thing works about the same way as most directional antennas. So this is an HF Yagi, probably a tribander for 10, 15, and 20 meters, or something like that. If you look closely, you can see some loading coils in the elements, which lets them be shorter at the expense of a little efficiency. Once they finish raising the tower, you can see this is a crank-up tower that's about halfway up, then the antenna will send signal in this direction. So the back of the antenna is facing us, and the front is facing away. The element in the center is the radiate or the driven element. It's just a dipole. The slightly longer element at the rear here is the reflector, and the shorter element at the front is the director. This three-element Yagi will have around 6 dB of gain. Each director element that you add adds more gain, but each one adds a little less than the one before. Now, here's an antenna with 26 elements. This stacked Yagi is made for the 2-meter band, and claims 17 dB of gain, which is a lot. And in terms of practical antennas, that's probably pretty close to the limit until you get into the gigahertz frequencies, where things get conveniently smaller. Well, how do these contraptions work? As in so many electronic things, it all starts with Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday discovered that passing a magnetic field over a wire created a voltage in the wire and some current in the wire and vice versa. In other words, inductance. In the Yagi antenna, the radiation from the driven element, the radiator, induces a current in the passive elements, the director and the reflector. So here we have a very artistic representation of a three-element Yagi. We're going to energize the center-driven element. The wave starts traveling through space and encounters the director element. It induces a current in that element, which creates another wave. Now, because of the spacing between the elements, and because that director element is a little short, so it's a little capacitive, the new wave is in phase with the first wave. They add together, and now we have a new, bigger wave headed in the forward direction. It's that big purple one in this picture. Meanwhile, at the back of the antenna, the wave from the radiator encounters the reflector. That reflector is cut a little bit long, so it's inductive, and here comes the point of all that discussion of reactances, it's a bit delayed. And so the wave that leaves the reflector is out of phase with that first wave from the director. On paper, they add up to zero. In practice, the wave going out the back of the antenna is significantly reduced. And that's how a Yagi, and almost all other directional antennas, does the magic. 
Here's a cool animation that I found of this process. Here's the driven element. The radiator is right there in the center, and the signal from that is shown in red, and the total signal going out the front and back of the antenna is shown in green. Pretty cool. Yagi antenna. Well, that takes us to question and answer time, so I hope you'll stick around for that. And if we don't get to your question in this, feel free to come by our booth here at the Virtual Expo. Or if we're not in the booth or the expo is over, uh, drop by our website and drop us a line through our Contact Us uh, link. All right. Good morning, everybody. And we're ready for Q&A. Let me get uh, uh, our moderator, Mark, in here. Here he is. This is Mark Hello. Smith. And he will be moderating your questions. I don't see them, so I'm dependent on him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, they're in the chat window over on the right-hand side of the screen. Instead of graphics, uh, go to chat. But they'll be there. Hello. Uh, I um, <laughs> I'm Mark, N6MTS. I'll be asking the questions today. Um, we've got a few come in the chat room. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, you won't see other people's questions, so uh, but we see all of the questions. So go ahead and ask your question there. Um, and I also cannot respond in the chat window. Uh, we'll only be able to respond here. So first off, I want to thank you, uh, Michael. That was a fantastic presentation. And uh, I've been a ham for almost... 30 years now. It'll be 30 years next year. Uh, and I learned a lot from this presentation. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. I'll always love to hear that. And yeah. I can turn up some new nugget, you know? <laughs> All right. We're going to start out with a question from uh, Judy, WA7JR. Uh, they ask, does all this apply to two meter radio antennas as well? Uh, absolutely, Judy. And uh, I mean, these are general principles of antennas, and they're going to apply to just about anything. Um, the, uh, as I said, the, the, the Yagi is a good example of just about any directional antenna. The big exception would be a parabolic dish antenna. But chances are good you don't have a parabolic dish antenna for two meters because that would be a, a big old thing on your, on your roof. So, um, yeah, the, the, the principles apply whether it's two meters or 160 meters or even playing way down there in the in the uh, extra low frequency bands. Yep. You mean that I don't have a 160 meter uh, parabolic dish? No, <laughs> I've got I've got some friends up at Stanford that have a like a 96 foot dish or whatever it is, and wow. they, they can oh, do well, they course. can do. Yeah, they can do some HF on that thing. It's pretty impressive. I did uh, uh, back when I was doing audiobook narrations. I did one uh, on uh, unmanned space exploration, and it was kind of centered around a radio telescope in the uh, Soviet Union uh, because they did so many interesting things. And uh, yeah, so I, I learned a lot about that uh, that huge dish that they had, which is now just wreckage. It's just yeah it's deserted and it's yeah. this weird thing out in the landscape. I want to pass on a nice compliment from Clifford or Cl uh, yeah, Clifford. Thank you. N zero L K C great presentation. Thank you. Thank um, you and I've seen this come up several times. So let's ask this one. Uh, Dennis K four D G W asks, uh, Nope, that's not the one. I okay. We'll do this one. Uh, sorry, David, I'll get to yours next. Um, how does the LDP LPDA antenna work? So that's a new one to me. What does it stand for? I don't know. Uh, Dennis, why don't you uh, expand that acronym for us? And then I'm going to go to David's question, which is the one I meant to do. Which booth and vendor are you? David, N6O, or UOW. Uh, fa fast Track Ham Radio Education. We do all the Fast Track uh, license courses. And what's your website? FastTrackHam.com. Thank you for asking. There we go. <laughs> Um, all right, let's ask this one from Mike W7VO. With a Yagi, what does OWA stand for? Beats me. Uh, was, that's a new one to me. OWA. I was hoping you knew that because I've I've never heard that acronym either. I know, that's, that's, I'm sorry. I don't know. It'll be a good one to research for the book. Make a note. Yep. All right. Um John K0VAC asks, I came by some free six gauge wire. Will that make a good antenna if I can support it on a mast? Absolutely. 
yeah, the bigger the gauge, the more conductance you're going to have. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, most of us end up, you know, using 14 gauge or 12 gauge, but six gauges. I mean, yeah. If you got four, go with that. Yeah. It, it is going to be a support nightmare. Uh, the other advantage to having a thicker conductor wire is that it will have slightly better bandwidth. Uh, only slightly when you're talking about wire instead of tubing. Um, but the ratio between the length of your radiator and the thickness of your radiator uh, impacts its uh, the frequency bandwidth, which is nice. Yeah, for sure. Uh, ooh, all the questions are coming in fast and quick. I got they're scrolling oh, up. Oh, okay. We found out what the LPDA is all about. Ah. That's a, of course, a log, log periodic, periodic directional array. Uh, well, the log periodic is, um, gee, I need my sketch pad. Um, it's, it's basically a bunch of dipoles arranged on a beam. Um, and they're, each one is fed out of phase with the ones on either side of it. Uh, and so what that ends up being is it's kind of a, a mild Yagi, I guess you could say. It's sort of directional. It's not, a, it doesn't have the gain of a Yagi, but it can be as many bands as you care to put dipoles on it. Uh, so that's what an LPDA does. Um, and they're typically used more in the VHF range. Uh, I, I haven't run across an LPDA for HF. There's no, no electronic reason you couldn't build yeah. it. But they definitely exist. Reasons. <laughs> yeah, they're typically um, for receive antennas when you want a wide bandwidth for receive. As hams, we don't need a lot of transmit wide bandwidth. Uh, yeah. You know, we have very specific bands that we can transmit in. And if, I don't know if you noticed, but they're all harmonically related to each other. Or at least most of them are. Um, right. right. So you don't you don't typically need to fill in the gaps between those bands on transmit, but on receive. A lot of times we do want to. So they are very common for, I want to be able to receive efficiently everything between this frequency and that frequency. Uh, yeah. the, the old school common TV antennas were actually log periodics. Yeah, yeah. There, there were tons of LPDAs on, on top of rooftops around America yep. back before we, we got our, uh, our TV from fiber optics. <laughs> All right, next question from Scott, KM4KIY. What's the reason for an end fed versus a dipole? Um, convenience. That's that's the main reason. I mean, the truth is, if it's a long wire antenna, it's going to have certain performance parameters regardless of where your feed point is. Um, there, there was a fellow who used to write for QST I've forgotten his name at the moment, but I refer to him in the book. And he he tested all kinds of antennas and basically said, well, you know, you get the convenience of where you attach your feed point. And beyond that, it's, it's going to perform the way it's going to perform. So, yeah. But, you know, convenience is not an insignificant thing. Uh, you know, the difference between no antenna and an antenna is 100 so. percent. Yes. Um the uh, it also def uh, matters whether you're talking about a resonant half wave antenna or a random wire end fed uh, antenna. So th those are a little bit different as well. But but right. otherwise, everything you said is correct. And 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 random wires are the best. Random wires are not that random. There yes, are, exactly. There are specific lengths that work best. Because you want them to not resonate on any of the bands. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, there you're building a non-resonant antenna, which is a, a, a whole different bunch of mathematics and everything feeds that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cheered when you came on and said this, the, this is the horrible name for this antenna tuner. The antenna, this does not attune your antenna. I'm like, yes, I've been saying this forever. It is a variable matching network. It is not an antenna tuner. Yeah, it's, it, I, you know, I have this, I guess we've probably all heard some variation of the story that goes, I have this friend who tuned up a suspension bridge. No, he didn't. <laughs> he just, all he did was fool his, his transmitter into thinking that it was, it was feeding a 50 ohm load, but exactly. it, wasn't, it wasn't radiating. From okay. So let's go back to Mike's question about with, um, with a Yagi, what does OWA stand for? And it yeah. looks like Scott had an answer for us on this one. Optimized wideband antenna. 
I, I've never heard that phrase. So um, it's, it's a new one to me too. And there's advances in the science all the time. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. Uh, anyway. All right. Uh, let's go to Mike K seven M H M. What to look for when max power is on, but not going out. So I'm talking to the radio and nobody's hearing me. Um, the, the first thing to look at, of course, is going to be your SWR. Um, is it, you know, so high that it's forcing your transmitter to shut down? Uh, the, but the, the other place I'd look is in the near field of the antenna. You know, I, I get about once every two months or so, I, I, I get addle headed or something and I go on Facebook. <laughs> this is a mistake. Um, and, and there's inevitably some guy there talking about some antenna design. It could be any antenna design swearing this thing is nothing but a dummy load uh i'll guarantee you if i went and looked at his setup there's junk in his near field that is throwing off the impedance of the antenna and that's why he's not getting out um now swr i find though is kind of wildly overrated uh, especially by beginning hams if you do the actual math in terms of the power lost to SWR, even a two to one SWR doesn't cost you that much power. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's you know a couple of couple of dB, uh, big deal. You lost that much in your transmission line, probably. Um, so don't get don't get if, too hung up. If, on if that. you're at one point five SWR, don't go crazy trying to get to one point three because it's not going to make any difference. Yeah. I think the reason SWR got such the, the fan following, if you will, uh, is that it's easy to measure, right? You can measure it. You can measure it at your radio. You can measure it with some relatively easy equipment. Although the measurement at your radio is not the SWR that's at the feed point because exactly. you've got all the losses going up to your antenna and then back down to your antenna or from your antenna back down that affect that reading as well. So yeah, there's, um, there's a fun question on the, uh, I think it's in the extra exam uh, about uh, you You have uh, a mismatch. Basically, it says you have a mismatch at the feed point and uh, your antenna tuner is sitting by your transmitter. What is the real SWR in this system? Well, it's oh. the mismatch at the feed point because you haven't fixed that with your little MFJ antenna tuner. <laughs> at, the, at the transmitter, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Let's go look at a question from Arthur. I have about 130 feet of LMR 400 coax going to my antenna. How can I measure the current at my antenna to maximize the current? M or W1SWL. At the antenna. Um, unless you have, a, you know, one of those man lifts or something to get up there and, and you know, make a connection with an ammeter you're not going to measure that but I mean, here's how you measure it you pick up the microphone and you go cq 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 and if people hear you then you got enough current in the antenna and if not you need some more um 130 feet of i don't have my my let's see i have a table somewhere of loss yeah, uh, LMR 400 yeah. is good stuff. That'll be probably 2 or 3 dB at most. Yeah, it, I don't think you're losing a, a whole lot there. It's a pretty long run, but yeah. there are longer out there. Yeah. You know, ham radio is amazing. It really is. We were, I mean, I came out of commercial broadcasting. And uh, you know, 1,500 watts to me is, it's like something's broken. Yeah. We, we That's talk, your exciter. Yeah. We talk about 50,000 watts, 100,000 yeah. watts. In television, they are in the megawatts. Yeah. Uh, and yet, here we are, we dink along with most of us, have maybe 100 watts coming out of the transmitter, and then we lose all kinds of it on the way to the antenna, and then more in the antenna. And yet, we can talk to Japan. I mean, it's really pretty amazing what we accomplished with minor amounts of power. Yeah. Uh, okay, moving down. Why? Wow, this is a good one. Uh, from John KC1MBH. Why do we need a ballon at the antenna terminals? Ah, 
basically two reasons. One is it's an impedance matching device. So uh, like I talked about with the, uh, the off-center feed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you might have a, a 300 ohm feed point. Well, you need to somehow match up um, all the, the impedances as you go along so that maximum power is going into the antenna. The other uh, thing that balance do, uh, and this often gets neglected in, in, in installations, is they, they tend to uh, kill off um, uh, the, well, you know, bad currents coming back down your feed line that end up uh, creating uh, RF field on your transmitter. Then you reach over to touch the button and you get ow, an RF burn on your finger, or you just have lots of noise in your transmission and stuff like that. So uh, those balance help to really reduce that, the, the, those induced currents coming back down your feed line. May I do a, a small bit of self-promotion here? relevant Please to this question. Do. So yeah. at the last QSO today, not the one in March of this year, but in September of last year, I think, I did a presentation on measuring common mode current chokes, using a nano VNA to measure common mode current chokes. Um, and I talk about this very topic a lot. Where yeah. do you want to put a common mode current choke? Uh, the term ballon is a... a I'm not going to go into the details here. It, this will answer your question in a lot of detail and give you a lot more detail as well. Um, the impedance matching, like he mentioned, like John, um, uh, John, like Michael mentioned, sorry, John's quite, John's name is right on top of your face. So that's why I got screwed up. Uh, like Michael mentioned, but also the common mode current choking uh, is one of the best uh, things that you can do uh, at the antenna feed point for uh, um, making your antenna work better and safety in your shack, but also at the radio entry point uh, yeah. from the coax coming down into your radio will uh, eliminate a whole lot of RF noise coming into your shack and into your radio and make your receiver a lot quieter as well. And, and it can be so easy. Yep. I mean, just, you know, as you're, you know, you, just before your coax goes into the house, for instance, take a couple of loops, tie them with some cable ties. Congratulations. You've, yep. you've put a ballon in your life yep. and, and you're going to cut down that common mode current, which is the enemy. This is a fantastic question. Eric, WA1SXK asks, if you use a VNA, should you tune your antenna for the resonant frequency or for the lowest SWR? I've seen a six meter Yagi where the SWR happens to be lowest, but there is still reactants. Hmm. Okay, well, I would go for the lowest SWR just because that's that's going to result in the maximum power transfer. Uh, I'm not sure how that that happens. I mean, on paper, the resonant frequency is where the reactances disappear. Uh, so um, maybe that's a measurement uh, artifact or something because the electronics are resonance. That's what resonance is. It's yep. where all the reactants disappears out of the system and you just have resistance. But the model of a dipole as being a 50 ohm impedance uh, at resonance is a very rough one. It's actually closer to 72. So, yep. um, and if you've got a 72 ohm purely resistive load being fed by a 50 ohm system, you're going to have an SWR that's not one to one when yep. the antenna's at resonance. Yeah, that's so. True. So this is actually a very common thing that low SWR is where the ma the magnitude of the impedance, which is when you're doing the complex numbers, you got the real and the reactive, and then the actual magnitude of that impedance is the hypotenuse of that of that triangle. Um, when the magnitude of the impedance of your antenna matches 50 ohms, that's where your SWR is going to be one to one. But you've got that little bit of reactance. Uh, and so the actual resonant points is when you have no reactants and it's purely resistive, but that magnitude is not exactly 50. So you're going to have a slightly I, higher SWR. I, I had, uh, I hadn't thought, thought that, uh, that through, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So there it is. That's, that's why you have that, that little weirdness there. So the question is, which one should you tune for? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the numbers we're talking about here are so small, it's not going to matter. Uh, yeah. If you're in that area, you're going to be fine. Yeah, uh, and, and tune for the loudest one would be. Yes, yes, tune for loudest background noise because or t- loudest receive signal or, or whatever because that's when you're going to be the most efficient. And it may yeah. be neither of those two points, right? That's right, yeah. It, the, most efficient, the most efficient point of your antenna may not be at lowest SWR or at resonance. So, yay, complexity. <laughs> uh, all right, so here's a, a answer to this. The WA3FET invented the optimized wideband Yagi. Oh, okay. Uh, so, okay, cool. We both learned something today. Uh, it, oh, and here's another one from Bob. Optimized wideband antenna is an antenna feed point matching method developed by WA3FET that provides an increased feed point impedance. Okay, cool. Hey. Uh, oh my gosh, so many more questions that I have not been getting to. Um, you need to talk fast here. I know, right? Uh, Bill, K3BEB, says, My father, long ago, said I could put up an antenna if he couldn't see it. So I put up a long wire using 26-gauge wire. How much loss did I suffer? The antenna seemed to work well, and I made lots of contacts with a 15-watt transmitter. There you go. I mean, there's the beauty of ham radio. Uh, the a 26 gauge wire antenna on paper shouldn't work. You should be getting all kinds of resistive loss in there. Uh, but radiating and 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 so it works. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Now let me. Any of you thinking stealth antenna? Um, go out to any like field day setup or anybody with a dipole antenna. I defy you to look up quickly and see that antenna, even if it's even if it's made out of that six gauge wire that somebody had earlier. Uh, it disappears in the sky. It's stealthy as can be. I, I, we do a field day setup where we do a, uh, uh, a it's a triple tri band uh, dipole antenna and that thing hanging up there not that high just disappears into, into the sky nobody knows it's there until we go hey look up there there's an antenna yeah, okay. i'll also point out that the uh wire gauge is not as critical uh as it sounds like 26 gauge wires as long as you're not trying to put a kilowatt into it like if you're doing 100 watts or less 26 gauge wires can be just fine yeah yeah all right marcus w or n5zy asks how does a bazooka antenna work? Does it only radiate from the wire stinger on the end, or does the entire thing radiate? It's like a coax stub with a wire on the end. A bit hard to understand. Well, um, a point source won't radiate, um, even though that calculus that I showed in the uh, in, in the presentation is the calculus for uh, what a point source will radiate when fed with a sine wave source. A point source really won't radiate. You have to have some physical length in order to make something radiate. So I think I hope that answers the question. Earl, WA4KBT asks, what is the near field? Is it within a quarter wavelength, half wavelength, something like that? Um, depends on the on the uh, length of the antenna. For our average uh, half wave dipole, it's... Um, one wavelength? I think it's one wavelength is, is safe. I've got that. In, I had that in the presentation, and now I've forgotten. I'm one of those people that numbers go into my head, and then they go out of my head almost instantly. Yeah, so, uh, but there's a, there's a formula for calculating it that's really pretty simple. And, you know, if you're out of wavelength, you're good to go. You're good. But I think it's a half wavelength for a half wave dipole. <laughs> Excuse me. It also uh, isn't a sharp transition, right? Like it, it right. it's kind of a bell curve of effect, right? Yeah, it's like the farther out you get, the, you know, the better. Yeah. Um, All right, uh, Joshua KN six GFZ asks. You mentioned that a tuner tricks a radio into putting all of its power into the antenna when there is a high impedance. Mathematically, is the power output the same after the tuning as before the tuning? Great talk. Um, yeah, you still got a hundred watts or whatever coming out of the uh, out of the radio and going into the tuner. Oh, I think he was talking about after the tuner, between the tuner and the antenna. Ah, 
Well, you're going to have loss in the tuner. There's you know, long ago, Robert Heinlein wrote Tanstoffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And right. so uh, that antenna tuner is going to cost you some watts in the in, in that matching network. Um, but so, those are those are losses, though, right? That's 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 an artifact of non-perfect con- capacitors and inductors. Exactly. Is that is it because you've put a? If we had this, if I could wave my magic wand and and manifest a perfect inductor and a perfect capacitor with no resistive losses at all, um, would we still have less power coming out the other side of the magic network? I'm I'm going to say you have the same. If you've got those ideal capacitors yeah. and ideal inductors which come from the ideal electronics corporation yep, yep, corporate, yep. Uh, then you, you should have yeah 100 watts going, I, going into the antenna i i believe that is that that's my understanding as well yeah all right um clifford n0lkc asks is a ballon essentially a transformer also yeah yeah it's 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 uh, an auto transformer so every coil is a transformer. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Um, it, it also depends on the ballon design because there are some that are co- that are chokes that don't actually transform impedance. Um, yeah, I mean they're not they're not necessarily a tra- an impedance transformer, but they are a transformer. Yeah, uh, you just yeah, might true. be a one to one transformer. Yeah, fair. Yeah. All right, Clifford asks, um, why is a ballon preferred over a tuner? It's, it, one, it's easier to make, and two, you can stick a ballon up at the feed point of the antenna. That tuners are it. tuners are harder to do that. Yeah, yeah, really, they do different things. I don't I don't think one is preferred over the other. They they solve different problems, or they address different yeah. problems. I mean, you can you can get those auto tuners that go right at your feed point, and they run off of uh, twelve volt being fed on your coax and very snazzy and essentially that's a a really jazzy ballon uh, so i mean ballon is this yeah. it's not a thing it's just it's a bunch of things it means balanced to unbalanced yeah there are un uns there are bal bals or, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the term ballon definitely is over widely used yeah uh, i will definitely agree with that all right, John uh, KC1MBH asks: When I feed a dipole with coax, the outside braid is connected to the chassis of the transmitter, which is grounded. Why doesn't the current on that side just go to ground and not up to the antenna? That's a good question. Okay. Well, so this this gets us into the exotic topic of ground. <laughs> Uh, which upon, upon which I can rant at great length, so you may have to just stop me here. So, the, the, so one, the Earth is not some kind of infinite sink for uh, electricity. Yeah, we kind of learn it that way in school, but it's not. It's just a big conductor, and not really a very good one. It's really more like a big resistor. So this is why, by the way, you need multiple ground rods sunk to to have an effective ground. And, uh, you know why lightning protection is about equalizing voltages. It's, it, it, your lightning protection doesn't magically take the lightning bolt to ground. All it does is you hope equalize the voltage uh, between two places where you don't want current to flow. It could be a million volts on each side, and as long as it's a million on each side, no current flows, and everybody's happy. So that's that's one thing. Two, that current is going into the earth. That's part of the circuit that is making your signal. It's kind of the, think of it as the other side of the antenna. Um, but, yeah, that's, it's like, it's not going to suck the signal out of your antenna it, it just is a big resistor that you're connected to the other thing to consider is that the coax is an unbalanced signal so we're not actually putting any voltage on that coax shield True. so if there's no voltage on the coax shield or zero volts on the coax shield relative to ground yes no current's going to flow that way we're putting all of the voltage on the center conductor 
And yeah. so we're using that coax shield to define our zero volt point up at yeah. the antenna. And then the center conductor moves up and down relative to that zero point volt, that zero volt point. And when it's above, current's going to flow that way on the center conductor and the only way it has to return is coming back down the inside of the shield and then when the center conductor is below that zero point voltage it's going to be sucking current back this way and the only place for that to come from is going that way on the inside of the coax shield yeah so yeah it's i like that calling it it's just a reference point because yeah yeah. voltage is always compared to what yes exactly all right uh David tells us that we have to put a time to put on our contester voice. No, actually, no, that's my radio DJ voice. I, I have to admit, when I was listening to your presentation, I'm like, this guy has done radio before. Uh, and then you mentioned that you've done an audio uh, audiobook narration. I'm like, yep, okay, that 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 works too. So uh, guilty, guilty, yeah. Uh, Paul likes our Heinlein reference or your Heinlein reference. Very good. Um, all right. I, those are all the questions I see in the Q and a section. Did I miss anything? If I've, if I've missed your question, please repost it. I'm gazing at the chat here. Great questions. Oh yeah. Uh, but, uh, lots of people explaining what an OWA is. Thank you very much for that. And an LPDA, uh, making sure it didn't mess with Oh, no, he answered that one. Da, da, da. Oh, I think we m- might have missed this one. Uh, David, WA, WA1JXD asks, when I tune up with a dummy load to the lowest SWR, why does my SWR read higher when I switch from the dummy load to my NFED half-wave antenna? Because your NFED half-wave antenna is a different impedance than your dummy load. Pretty much. I mean, you know, and dummy loads, by the way, are, are a great example of SWR does not tell you how well you're radiating. You could you get perfect SWR. That's right. With dummy load, and I guarantee you, you're not going to work Japan with that. <laughs> uh, audiobook and Kindle books are great. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you. Uh, just passed my technician exam on Thursday. Con- congratulations, Lisa. Excellent, Lisa, and welcome to the hobby, and and now get yourself a radio and get on the air. That's right. Uh, Yeah, let's see here. So we got a great job, guys. Uh, We got a nice and clear presentation. All right, I think that's it. We've got one minute left anyway to the top of the hour, so thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I almost called you Robert. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again, Michael. Um, And yeah. Um, I've been N6MTS. This is Michael Burnett, KF7KB. Remind everybody where they can find you online. Uh, FastTrackHam.com um, or or many uh, ham fests near you. That's right. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a great QSO Today Expo. Thanks, everybody. Mark, thanks a lot for your moderation. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>